What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so continuing our coverage on Dark Knight's Metal, we get into the origin of the Devastator. Devastator Batman, basically Doomsday Batman. <laughs> and it's really, really cool. And keep in mind, all these origin stories, and you'll notice this with the playlist down in the description, all the stories or all these origins basically come out of issues number two and number three. But it is still pretty cool to see all this stuff unfold because when it comes to the Devastator, it's just this Doomsday-based Batman is really all it is. But it's really cool because it asks the question, what would happen if Batman became Doomsday. Now keep in mind, in like the casting in the Forge, one of the things that DC established is that the tuning fork from Infinite Crisis was still there. A little bit of history, guys. When it came to Infinite Crisis, it was basically the rebirth of the multiverse is really all it was. But the way in which this was done was by a version of Lex Luthor from a different universe basically constructing these sort of tuning forks, which is to say these pillars that would lead to the creation of the multiverse by harnessing like cosmic energies, more or less. Now it dealt with like the anti-monitor, different things like that. But the whole idea was that after after Infinite Crisis was over and the Tuning Fork was destroyed, we never really saw it again. There was no reason to believe that it ever existed. It just kind of seemed like a, a one-time, you know, device that was there that served a particular purpose, and that was it. What the casting in the Forge revealed was that the Tuning Fork was still around, that Batman had taken it or something along those lines, and it was being held in the Fortress of Solitude. The Tuning Fork basically allows its wielder to channel all these different cosmic entities of a higher being into the Fork itself and then control the very nature of reality to do virtually anything thing they want to with it. And so what this does is it comes out of the task assigned to Devastator Batman by Barbados to basically travel to this tuning fork and to capture it, to essentially take it and bring it directly to Barbados himself so he can channel all of his energies into recreating the multiverse as he sees fit. Now, on the surface, it seems pretty straightforward, right? Like on the surface, it seems like all these different Batman come from the dark multiverse and their goal is to basically corrupt the, the positive multiverse and make it just like their own. But because of the fact that it was basically all hands on deck and response to the fact that we had all these different versions of the Dark Knights showing up and attacking virtually everybody, almost every single superhero responded. The Justice League of America, Batman's own Justice League team, the main Justice League itself, the Flash, Green Arrow, Green Lantern, the whole nine yards, they all basically responded as best they could. Now, in Justice League of America, which is actually a series that we haven't really covered yet, save for the prelude issues, basically the one shots of the characters who were brought into the team, Lobo is part of that team. And Lobo is a really cool character. He was kind of like like DC's answer to Wolverine in the sense that Lobo was designed to be over the top. He was designed to be crazy and goofy and just this super hardcore guy. You could imagine him just riding around in space on his motorcycle, blasting Metallica. So, I mean, it was kind of cool. But the whole idea is that he is a character who, in a lot of ways, is on par with Superman. He's a powerhouse. He was designed to be the sort of uh, muscle of the Justice League of America team in the sense that when Batman and his group show up to a conflict and it requires just brute force to overcome an enemy, Lobo's the guy you send in. But him going against Devastator Batman is a pretty interesting scenario because as far as I'm aware, I do not believe we've seen a story where Lobo has fought Doomsday one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, I don't know if they've ever fought. I'm not going to swear to that. If there is a story, let me know because we'll cover it. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is an interesting scenario. But the other half of this is that it also gives us this idea that Devastator is able to overcome some of the most powerful beings that are in the DC universe. And so in a lot of ways, he's the powerhouse of the Dark Knights of Barbados's forces. And so what we end up doing is we actually pick up about a day before in Metropolis itself, and we actually end up joining Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane. And this is kind of funny exchange here because Jimmy Olsen has been reading like all these conspiracy theories in terms of what's going on, all these dark nights popping up, things like that. Lois Lane's response, stop reading the internet. You know, I guess never go to internet.com. I have no idea. <laughs> but the internet is a dangerous place. But it's one of these funny little scenarios because when it comes to the character of Jimmy Olsen, while I wouldn't necessarily say that Lois Lois Lane sees him as a son. In a lot of ways, she plays like a motherly role to him. I mean, not in the sense that like she took him to raise. She doesn't, you know, feed him and different things like that, but she does look out for him. And it's always been that way. Ever since Jimmy Olsen was first introduced to DC Comics, it took time, you know, it took several years for that sort of a uh, scenario to unfold, but it's always been that way to a degree. And so it's kind of cool to see how this exchange is still maintained. But the other half is you have to remember, Lois Lane is struggling. We talked about how during the events of Dark Knight's Metal 2, that Superman and Wonder Woman had shown 
shown up to try to confront Batman and stop him from going through this whole process of trying to find a way to defeat Barbados, only to have Barbados enter their realm anyway. And as soon as that happened, Superman and Wonder Woman were basically stripped of their life force and reduced down to almost a catatonic state and then sent to be held prisoners in the center of the dark multiverse. And so as far as Lois Lane is, is aware, her husband's just gone. But the fact remains, in the middle of her just kind of, you know, heading out and doing whatever it is that Lois Lane does, she's met by this devastator Batman. And this is cool because this gives us a side of his powers that we don't normally see. By and large, when it comes to these Dark Knights of Barbados, you know, despite the fact that they are basically some version of Batman from an alternate dimension, they have been modified both in terms of their powers and in terms of their physical appearance to differentiate them and make them a little more menacing too. But we couldn't help but believe when the mask comes off Red Death, he looks like Bruce Wayne. When the helmet comes off of, you know, the Drowned, she looks like, you know, well, what Bruce Wayne would look like as a chick. When these different uh, outfits and these different uniforms come off, they will look like Bruce Wayne. And it makes sense that Devastator Batman is more of a transitionary character, which is to say Bruce Wayne can become the Devastator as opposed to him being stuck that way. And so it is kind of interesting because what we end up finding out is this really cool origin story in the sense that in Earth Negative One, somewhere along the line, Superman just lost it. And we don't know why. We don't know what caused this. And even within the story, there's no answer given here. You know, Devastator Batman says, we don't know what it was. We don't know if it was Lex Luthor who exposed Superman to some version of red kryptonite that mutated him in an uncontrollable way. We don't know if it was like Brainiac who seized control of him. We have no clue what it was, but for some reason or another, Superman snapped and basically turned on Batman and all the members of the Justice League. Now, again, much like the other stories that we've seen, we're not really told what happened to the other members of the Justice League. We're largely left to believe that Superman killed him and he really saved Batman for last, but this is a massive betrayal on the side of Bruce Wayne in this negative one universe. Because remember, regardless of what universe we're talking about, regardless of what story we're referencing, for years and years and years, Batman and Superman were the best of friends. It wasn't until until the Dark Knight Returns that Batman and Superman fought for the first time and that became an on-running theme of their stories whenever there's some kind of a reboot or whenever DC wants to just hype up sales and they have the two of them fight each other. But when the new 52 first cropped up, it was the two of them getting to know each other. When DC Rebirth happened, it was the new Superman getting to know Bruce Wayne. It was always this idea that as time progresses, whenever they first encounter each other, it takes time for their friendship to grow. But when it does, they become the best of friends. And so when you're Bruce Wayne and you know your parents were killed when a mugging gone wrong in Crime Alley in Gotham City, and you've been dealing with that your entire life, and then you find probably the closest friend you're ever going to have who just suddenly ups one day and betrays you and the rest of the Justice League, there's almost no coming back from that. It's a psychological break that takes place in the mind because it's really Bruce Wayne who looks around and says, I can really find no happiness in this world. And so it's sort of ironic because while he does have a kryptonite spear, and while that would necessarily be able to take out Superman, it's actually a genius turn of events because for the most part, that's really the only thing Batman fans do have when it comes to like Batman beating Superman. Like, well, you know, Batman would fight Superman and they would just keep going with a Superman would just punch his head off or he would punch a hole in him or he would throw him in the sun. And then it's, well, not if Batman had kryptonite. And so it becomes this sort of running gag. It becomes this idea of what use is Batman against Superman if he doesn't have kryptonite on his side. And so this takes that entire argument and flips it on his head. And what ended up happening is somewhere along the line, Batman basically created or in some form adapted the Doomsday Strain. Now this requires a little bit of conjecture and sort of hapha uh, haphazard guessing on our part in the sense that we can more or less assume that the events of like the death of Superman probably happened in this negative one universe, which is to say Doomsday was created on Krypton eons before Kryptonians arrived and became super smart and then just kind of, you know, fell in stasis, was sent to Earth and lived on Earth or basically was buried under the ground for, you know, however many billions of years or something along those lines. Eventually wakes up, he and Superman fight, both Superman and Doomsday die, and then that's really about it. We can assume that happened. We can just basically basically sort of make that claim. But regardless, the events unfolded a little bit differently in the sense that following this presumed death of Superman, Batman basically duplicated the Doomsday strain. Now again, there's a lot of other scenarios that could have unfolded here. It could have been that Batman discovered Doomsday, that maybe Doomsday never did kill Superman. Everybody else, you know, basically fought alongside Superman and killed Doomsday. But regardless of the reason, Batman basically took the Doomsday strain and blended it with his own body. And what this does is it turned him into this, this literal wrecking machine that can destroy, destroy you know, Superman 
Superman. Being able to sort of expunge this kryptonite gas of sorts, takes Superman out, it weakens him, it allows Batman to kill him. And from this point, that's when the psychological snap basically crosses a line that Bruce Wayne can't come back from. But here's the funny thing about this. We get a lot more of an expose from like the Dark Knight of the Batman who laughs than we do from anybody else. And this is cool because we haven't really seen that too often, right? Like when it comes to this mysterious version of the Batman who laughs, probably the most popular character of Dark Knight's Metal and the one character everybody wants an origin story for, he's basically just popped up at the end of the story. We get this whole origin story of this character, some events take place, you know, and then this version of Batman pops up and says, hey, what if I could present you with a world where everything is, you know, opposite of this and where you can achieve the one goal you've been wanting to achieve and, you know, so on and so forth, basically tapping into the desires of these evil versions of Batman. In this scenario, Devastator sees him and immediately calls him out as the Joker and like the Batman who laughs doesn't deny it. And that's the cool thing about this is because we get these little tidbits, these little goodies that kind of go into the story itself and they sort of help to like push forward all these theories that people have, all these ideas that people have on who the Batman who laughs is. I mean, I think personally that it's basically Batman from the killing joke. I think that it's a version of Batman who killed the Joker at the end of the story and then became the Joker. Or it's Joker who killed Batman and then became Batman because Joker realizes he needs Batman. I have no idea what the case may be. But it is kind of cool to basically speculate and to experiment. And these little bitty conversations that are extended by a couple lines kind of give us this little bit of beefing up of information. And again, it allows our wildest curiosities to run awry. And so again, much like the other Batman who were out there, because of the fact that uh, Devastator has, is basically disillusioned with Superman in the sense that he came to the belief that Superman basically told everybody, I will be your savior. I will be your bright shining star. I will be the being that will help lead you into a better tomorrow. Because of the fact that he's become disillusioned with that, with Superman becoming a bad guy, the Batman who laughs basically says, what if I told you there's a universe where people don't know who, how evil Superman is? They don't know what you know, but we can go there and we can make them know. We can show them who Superman really is. It's tapping into the hatred for Superman that the Devastator has. And so what this does is it basically has Devastator align himself immediately with the Batman who laughs, joining the forces of Barbados and then invading Earth Zero during the events of Dark Knight's Metal 2. So again, that's how all this stuff sort of wraps around and comes back together again. The difference here is that when Devastator Batman effectively shook the hand of Lois Lane, what he did is he infected her with this sort of doomsday virus in the sense that what she's begun doing is she turned herself into a carrier. And as a result, she's basically spreading this virus throughout the city, not realizing it. It's an airborne strain. Everybody who she comes into contact with infects everybody else. And because it's the city of New York, and because it's such a high population density, as she breathes, she infects other people who in turn infect other people. And so it's just this strain that basically multiplies exponentially and just spreads throughout the city of, uh, of New York like a wildfire. Now, you also have the arrival of like Kara Zor-El and, you know, uh, Lana Lang. You have these members of the Superman family who show up in their efforts to try to defeat Devastator, uh, Devastator Batman, but they're no match against him. I mean, they can't take him on, you know, just because of the fact that he is so incredibly strong and incredibly powerful. The funny thing about this, though, is it also sees the involvement of Jonathan Kent. Now, when I read this, Lois Lane runs back into their home. She's like, okay, we got to activate the safe room, but the safe room won't activate because the patio doors open and Jonathan Kent's hovering out there and intends to jump into the fight. Now, let me tell you something. I don't know how I would react if Jonathan Kent died. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably cry. I love Jonathan Kent as a character. He's one of my favorite characters from DC Rebirth. Kid Superman, Superboy, he's just, he's so vibrant and he's so fun and he's learning about what it means to be a hero. And it's so funny to see him react, you know, with like Damian Wayne, different things like that. Thankfully for us, this doesn't happen. Lois Lane grabs his son, yanks him back in, throws him in the panic room and locks the door because she herself is starting to manifest into Doomsday. Now keep in mind, the reason why this matters is because it seems as though Devastator Batman is unique unto himself. Doomsday is basically a being built for death and destruction. That's all he is. That's all he wants to do. And so the implication here is that where Bruce Wayne has this Doomsday strain injected into himself, it allows him to control it. For anybody else who becomes Doomsday, they won't be that lucky. They'll basically just become a variant of Doomsday and all they're going to do is just tear things to pieces. But this is crazy because it's basically this idea that Devastator Batman says, that's the point of all this. You know, grabbing this tuning fork, whisking it off to Barbados, it's him essentially saying, this world is going to 
to come to grips with the fact that Superman is not their savior. Because what's going to happen is while all this is going on, while all these people are being transformed, while the world is burning down around them, they're all going to look up and they're going to say, where's Superman? And with Superman nowhere to be found, they're going to lose hope. They're going to lose faith. And so when Superman returns, assuming that everything goes back to normal, they'll turn their backs on him. That's what Devastator Batman is hoping for. And so again, it's interesting and it's really intriguing because what happens is that at the end of this origin, this runs directly into Dark Knight's Metal 3, 4, 5, and 6. It runs into this idea of the events that follow with Barbados having this tuning fork and using his cosmic energies to achieve whatever it is that ends up coming next. But with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like. Crazy question. Crazy question here. Who do you think would win in a fight? Devastator Batman or Shazam? It had nothing to do with this story. <laughs> Shazam has not seen not a hide nor hair in the story, but I'm just curious. Who do you guys think would win? Devastator Batman or Shazam? Let me know. Post a comment down below because I'm kind of curious. And I will catch you all later. Peace.